you are a psychiatrist. Yeah. Yes, he is, with a new textbook that's out there. Mm -hmm. And he has won many, many awards uh, over time. And I couldn't possibly name them all, but there's quite a few. But there's one I really love. And uh, But first, I just say that he was the president of the American Geriatric... He was the president of the American Association for Geriatric Medicine in the U.S. And he was also the president of the... Um, and Geriatric Mental Health Foundation in the U.S., which is pretty stunning. Uh, but my favorite one is he was named among the best doctors <laughs> in America and Canada. Wow. wow. And, and, and the gerontologist of the year. Oh. So look wow. at that. Wow. <laughs> so he, he's speaking about brain health across Thank you, Lynn. What a lovely introduction that was. That, that was so great. Would you mind doing that again? <laughs> At my advancing age, I can't hear that kind of stuff uh, often enough. Well, it is a privilege to be with you here today uh, to talk about brain health, and particularly from a lifespan perspective, uh, and why talking about this topic from a lifespan perspective is so important, uh, hopefully will become clear to you in, in just uh, a few moments. But um, it's, it's pretty clear to us that um, the journey of aging is really where we need to start focusing uh, more heavily as opposed to just the final destination of old age. Uh, and that's a mandate, I think, for all of us uh, interested in the aging field. Um, there's no doubt that there are decades of research that have demonstrated to us that well-being and health status in older age is determined by a number of different factors. Certainly how active we are uh, throughout our life, how social engaged we are, um, how much financial security we have, and if there was ever a time to be thinking about that, it's now. Um, how much independence and autonomy we have um, that we retain as we get older, and certainly uh, the degree to which we engage in healthy behaviors, uh, prevention, and wellness throughout our lifespans. So much of what influences how successfully we age are factors that we can modify or influence when we're younger. Uh, so we shouldn't wait until we're seniors to start to take action to age well. We must take action really from the earliest days uh, of our lives on this earth. And if that's important for physical health, increasingly our science is telling us this is vital for maintaining good brain health. So this really does dictate, I think, a new emphasis for our field of geriatrics and gerontology and certainly the brain field. We must focus more on the longer process of aging versus the stage of older age. Uh, again, focusing on the journey versus the destination. There needs to be, uh, throughout our disciplines, a much stronger emphasis on prevention, on optimizing health fitness and wellness promotion versus uh, so exclusively addressing health failure, meaning chronic and terminal disease management. Uh, and thus, uh, there's an imperative for us to begin to shift our attention a bit more forcefully from tertiary to secondary to primary prevention. For brain health, I would posit we must do in the 21st century what we largely accomplished in the 20th century for heart health. Uh, in, the 21st, in the 20th century, we learned that um, if we wanted to optimize heart health when we were older people, we certainly wouldn't only study uh, 88-year-olds with advanced congestive heart failure. That wouldn't make any sense. If we wanted to improve the cardiovascular health of the population, uh, we wouldn't only do research in people with advanced heart disease. Uh, we would be very focused on how to prevent heart disease, what are the risk factors, helping people to manage those risk factors so that their chances of getting heart disease when they're older is uh, reduced. Well, it turns out that the same is now true for brain health. But for most of the last several decades, in thinking about how to keep our brains healthy, we have largely focused on seniors suffering from Alzheimer's disease or stroke. And these, by their nature, are conditions of advanced brain failure. So while it makes little sense to only try to advance the field in cardiovascular health by focusing on advanced heart failure, uh, similarly, it makes little sense in the brain field to only focus on people with advanced brain failure, meaning people with clinical symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. So that then pushes us uh, to focus not just on dementia, but on other aspects of cognitive impairment. For those of you who are not as familiar with dementia, I thought I would just describe it briefly. Dementia, of which Alzheimer's disease, as you know, is the most common cause, is a syndrome of acquired and persistent impairment across a variety of cognitive realms. Uh, the best known is the memory impairment of dementia, 
the patients with these difficulties also certainly have language problems, as demonstrated on this slide, visuospatial abilities, problems with planning, organizing, and sequencing. We call that executive functioning, as well as the ability to manipulate numbers and some other intellectual functions. And certainly in dementia, there are also uh, behavioral changes. Uh, why dementia is so catastrophic for people and why we can't uh, wait for dementia to occur before we take action is that dementia essentially robs people of the ability to fulfill uh, some of the most vital roles and responsibilities that give meaning to our lives what it means to be a spouse or a parent or a productive worker, all of these things are significantly undermined when we lose our cognitive abilities when we suffer from dementia. Again, the most prominent cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. It accounts for approximately 60 to 70 percent of all cases of dementia. Um, what's widely believed to be the second most common cause of dementia is cerebrovascular disease or vascular dementia. And um, if we were in the UK right now, uh, many of us might argue that actually uh, dementia with Lewy bodies as opposed to vascular dementia is the second most common cause after Alzheimer's disease. And dementia with Lewy bodies, if it's not familiar to you, is a condition where patients manifest symptoms reminiscent certainly of Alzheimer's disease but also of Parkinson's disease. And then there are a host of miscellaneous other conditions that can also give rise uh, to dementia such as traumatic brain injury or infections of the central nervous system. Why society now is so focused on cognitive impairment is because age is the number one risk factor for having cognitive impairment or dementia. And with the aging of the population, which is occurring at a very rapid rate across the world, we expect that the number of people suffering from dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease, is going to grow quite considerably. Uh, this slide demonstrates to you how rapid this growth is going to be uh, here in Canada. Um, it's sobering to, to consider that uh, here in Canada, uh, and in North America for that matter, uh, the number of people aged 65 and above uh, is going to literally double uh, in the next 15 uh, to 20 years. So imagine the demography, uh, the distribution of age in North America, in Canada, and the United States is going to closely approximate uh, the state of Florida. So. People often uh, smile a little bit or giggle when we say that, and I think it's a smile or giggle of anxiety. Uh, meaning, are there really going to be that many early bird specials in all the restaurants, and what's it going to be like to try to drive through a crowded parking lot? Um, but this is the reality that society is witnessing the largest growth in a senior population than we've ever experienced. And the first boomers, I think, as you recognize, are going to turn 65 next year. Uh, so this creates a, quite a challenge, perhaps. But it also creates, I think, an opportunity for society. You know, um, I gave a talk in this series about two years ago, and I talked about the coming storm of dementia. And uh, some of my colleagues uh, talk about the tsunami of aging. Uh, and um, all I can tell you is that uh, when I think about a tsunami approaching, uh, my inclination is not to try to manage the tsunami, but to try to run from it and uh, run to the hills and get to safe ground. Well, we can't afford that luxury here with, um, with the rise in the senior population. We need to manage it, and we need to take advantage of it. And uh, for some of us, rather than be worried about being buried under this large wave of seniors, maybe instead we should consider the opportunity posed by taking out our surfboards and riding the crest of what could be a wonderful wave if we just take action uh, sooner rather than later. Now, what's the opportunity then uh, for the brain field? Um, well, I think uh, the demographic imperative um, gives us an opportunity to focus a lot more than we ever have before on helping middle-aged people and perhaps even younger people to know how to age as, as well as possible. And that means in the brain field, there's really the opportunity now to identify new preventions, new interventions, and maintenance programs that the science is now telling us can transform our notion of what it means to have an aging brain. And there are several impact points, I think, where we can take advantage of the science. One certainly is in prevention, as illustrated by uh, the red uh, dotted line. Uh, as we age, we do lose certain cognitive functions. We get more forgetful. We have more difficulty multitasking. Uh, we're not as quick uh, to formulate a strategy to solve a problem. Uh, this shouldn't distress us any more than when we get up in the morning as we get older. Uh, we might notice things that I've noticed as I've gotten older. For example, I have less up here, less hair up here than I'd like to have. Uh, and uh, 
uh, paradoxically, I'm growing hair in places that I don't wish to have hair grow. Um, but I accept these as the inevitable consequences of aging, and so I must accept as well that I'm getting more forgetful as I get, get older, and uh, I need to put more stuff into my Blackberry to remind me of what I'm supposed to be doing next. And this is just a part of getting a bit older. But I do know um, that the science is helping me to understand that there may be things I can do to strengthen my cognitive ability as I get older, or at least to maintain it, uh, just like we're never too old to get on that treadmill or to get involved in physical exercise, watch our nutrition, and get ourselves into the best shape of our lives, no matter how old we are. So the same opportunity, I think, does exist for brain health, and that's what we're going to talk about over the next several minutes. Well, what this promise has led to is a movement, a movement that is occurring globally, and it's called the brain fitness movement. And so the fundamental question is, is this uh, a realistic hope for society, or is it a bunch of hype? And uh, that's what I want to talk to you all about uh, uh, over the next uh, uh, several minutes of my talk here. Well, you know, why do we feel comfortable with an increasing fo focus on maintaining good brain health throughout the lifespan, meaning brain fitness, as opposed to overwhelmingly devoting our efforts to advanced brain failure, meaning dementia. Well, what we've come to recognize over approximately two decades of research now in, in laboratories around the world, including at the Salk Institute in California, Princeton University, and my home state of New Jersey, <coughs> is that um, we do not, as was previously thought, hit a brick wall in terms of our brain's ability to continue to be strengthened no matter how old we are. It used to be thought that once we got into our 30s, we sort of maxed out, we plateaued in terms of the capacity to build more intellectual ability, and that it was downhill after that. Um, what the science now tells us is that we retain the capacity through what's called neurogenesis and neuroplasticity to continue to strengthen our brain's function, to build increasing levels of what's called brain reserve, and I'm going to talk about that in quite some detail. One way to think about it, if you're not that fluent with neuroscience, is to think of it in this way. The brain is largely a very rich forest uh, that's made up of a collection of a very beautiful, uh, well-endowed trees. Um, as we get older, um, we start to see some of those trees shrink in their foliage. They're not as thick uh, in their branches, and so the forest starts to thin out. That's an inevitable consequence of aging. We lose what's called synaptic density, the density, the connectedness between neighboring populations of brain cells or neurons. Now, it turns out that through neurogenesis, we have now found that adult human beings still have within their forest, within their brains, the capacity to grow new trees. That's called neurogenesis. We have neural stem cells that if properly stimulated and nourished, have the potential to grow into mature trees or mature neurons, so we can grow more nerve cells. That's called neurogenesis. Realistically, though, that does get much harder as we get older, and so scientists around the world are now trying to figure out how to identify those neural stem cells and stimulate them in such a way that we can grow more brain cells, grow more trees. In addition, uh, we now know that with the trees we have, we can grow more branches and more leaves on those trees. And that's really the, the concept of neurotrophism and neuroplasticity. Uh, and so we can keep that forest as thick as possible. The thicker the forest, the more connected the trees are with one another, meaning the more connected our brain cells are with one another, the more efficient our brain function, the better our cognitive abilities. Everybody with me? Okay. All right. We also know that some of the risk factors for brain failure can be mitigated, can be lessened, particularly if we take action in midlife. Whether we have brain failure or not, whether we get Alzheimer's disease or not, is not a single proposition. Uh, it's the culmination of several different risk factors all coming together. Some of these risk factors we can't do much about. They are genetically predetermined. But some of these risk factors also have to do with the rest of our overall bodily health. And increasingly, what we're, what we're finding now is that there is a closer link than was originally thought between cerebrovascular risk factors and risk factors for the brain failure of Alzheimer's disease. So for example, the better we control high blood pressure, the better we keep our weight down, the better we make sure we're in good glucose regulation and don't have type 2 diabetes, 
the more we physically exercise ourselves, we're finding that these same things that protect us from stroke and heart disease also appear to be protective factors for diseases like Alzheimer's disease. And so um, these things we already know that we can do uh, for physical health, and so now the imperative is to also embrace some of these things for brain health. Another very important finding now is that the pathological changes that occur in our brains that give rise to the symptoms of a disease like Alzheimer's disease occur not at the time that the symptoms first appear. The pathology begins years before the onset of symptoms. Years before the onset of symptoms. In fact, some people believe the pathology of Alzheimer's disease may actually begin decades before the onset of symptoms. It's a scary thought. Today, we think about Alzheimer's disease as a disease of old people because that's when the symptoms start to appear in our 70s and our 80s. But if some scientists are right that the pathology begins decades before, then Alzheimer's is really a disease more of middle age whose symptoms express themselves when we're an older age. And so while that's scary, it's also an opportunity. It means that we can intervene before the onset of symptoms and perhaps not only slow down the progression of the illness, but if we're fortunate, arrest the progression of the illness. Think of it this way. Many scientists in our field believe that if we could delay the onset of the clinical symptoms of Alzheimer's disease by five years, by intervening when we first identify the changes occurring before symptoms, if we can delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease by five years with the right intervention or prevention techniques, the prevalence of the disease would be reduced by half, by half. And if we could actually delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease by 10 years, many of the leading thinkers in the field believe that would essentially eradicate the disease because it presents its symptoms in older age. And so if we can delay the symptoms of the dementia by 10 years, then people will have died of other causes uh, before they ever became so confused that they lost their very sense of who they were as people. Um, so this is a great challenge for our field. It's a great opportunity for our field to intervene before the onset of symptoms. The science is now accumulating, and I'm going to share some of it with you, that we have techniques readily available today that are being developed that include brain imaging, cognitive stress tests, essentially the cardiac treadmill, but for the brain, biomarkers, all of these techniques, we believe, through more uh, research investigation, will help us to predict incident Alzheimer's disease and help us take advantage of the great opportunity I mentioned ago to try to prevent the onset of symptoms or at least delay them. Now, I do want to give you a little bit of a background on some studies I'm going to share by telling you about a genetic risk factor which is sufficiently compelling that we are now using it to help us determine how we might identify people at risk for the disease and test uh, other uh, mechanisms for intervening early. So uh, probably the best established genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is something called the ApoE4 allele. Um, the ApoE gene uh, is carried on chromosome 19 and there are three different variations or allelic variants of this gene, um, ApoE2, ApoE3, and ApoE4. And uh, we inherit from either of our parents one of these three possible varieties, either an E2, E3, or E4. The ApoE4 variety is the one that confers an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. It's found in approximately one in five of us and uh, the ApoE4 increases our risk of getting Alzheimer's disease to the following extent. If we've inherited one of these from one of our parents, then it increases our risk above the general population by about threefold. It gives us about a 30 to 40 percent chance of getting Alzheimer's disease by the time we're in an advanced age. Um, but that also means that do we have a 60 or 70 percent chance of not getting Alzheimer's disease. So it's not all that helpful alone as a predictive variable. <coughs> ApoE4 may have modest effects in predicting cognitive decline in older persons, but because of what I just said before, ApoE alone doesn't have adequate predictive value. Now what I told you was if you inherited one of these alleles from one of your parents, you have about a 30 or 40 percent chance of getting Alzheimer's disease by the time you're 90 years old. 
If you inherit two of these, though, one from mom and one from dad, then your risk for Alzheimer's goes up quite dramatically, and then your risk, by the time you're about 90, goes up uh, by about uh, 80%. So that's a significant risk. All right. Now, what are some of the arguments, then, for early intervention? Well, here, here's a study, and I apologize for not having the, the reference on this slide. Here's a study that was published a couple of years ago, and it's akin to a study that was done in young soldiers who were killed in combat in the Korean War. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that cardiovascular study, but young soldiers were killed uh, in the Korean War, tragically. And um, their hearts were examined at that time to see whether, even in young age, there was evidence that they might already be showing atherosclerosis or coronary artery disease that could predict, then, incident heart disease, like heart attacks when they're in their 40s or 50s or perhaps older. And in that study, it was found that many of these young soldiers already were showing evidence of atherosclerosis and abnormal vasculature within their hearts. And presumably, if these soldiers had lived, they would have been the ones to go on to develop heart attacks in midlife. Well, a similar study was done in young people that had suffered death uh, largely from accidents or other illnesses that didn't have any material effect on their brains. And these young people were divided into two groups. Those that carried an APOE4 allele, meaning a risk factor for getting Alzheimer's disease, and those that did not carry that risk factor. Both groups of young people who had died were cognitively normal. None of them had confusion. None of them had dementia. Again, they had died from other causes. What was interesting about this study was that despite their young age, 36% of those that carried the genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease already showed the pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's in their brains. Uh, versus only 11% of people without the uh, APOE4 allele, without that risk factor. So three times the number um, had already pathological changes of Alzheimer's, and these are young people, well before we would ever expect them to develop a dementia. Increasingly, we're using neuroimaging, brain scans, to help us determine whether there might be changes that are detectable prior to the onset of cognitive impairment. And again, we know, I said this before, that just with normal aging, there's going to be some decline in cognitive performance. Um, when that becomes clinically significant, we call that mild cognitive impairment. And when it becomes really significant, we call that dementia, with Alzheimer's disease being the most common cause. <coughs> Largely, we use brain scans now when someone already has the dementia syndrome, when they already have advanced brain failure, when they're brains are already heavily damaged by whatever the disease process is. Uh, but the future is going to be the evolution of technologies, brain scanning technologies, where we can image uh, people who are relatively healthy cognitively, but where we might be seeing the initial signs of some changes that put them at risk for developing dementia when they get older. And I want to show you some of that, because this is some of the evidence that's been mounting that's been shifting the focus of our field towards fitness as opposed to failure. And then I'm going to talk about where the field is uh, likely headed over the next decade or so. So here are representative examples of a technology that's now been around uh, for brain imaging for uh, 20 years or so. And this is called positron emission tomography, or PET scanning. And what this measures is cerebral metabolic activity how active the brain cells are, and the measure of how active they are is how much sugar or glucose the brain cells are consuming. The healthier the brain cells, the more metabolically active they are, the more sugar they require for the energy requirements uh, for them to, to do their work as brain cells. So what you find is the more red and yellow you see, the more glucose that's being used by the brain cells, and the healthier those brain cells are. So if you just look to the far left of the scan, um, what you see are two slices, one a little bit higher up in the brain than the other, that show you a normal brain. And you see a lot of red and yellow, a lot of glucose metabolism. That's great. In the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, with mild dementia syndromes, you can already start to see, particularly in the, the back part or the posterior part of the brain where those the black arrows are, already a reduction in the red and yellow colors. And that tells us that those brain cells are not normally utilizing glucose. And then in late Alzheimer's disease, you can see in both sections, the top and bottom one, there's hardly any red or yellow at all in some of these critical brain regions that are responsible for many of our intellectual or cognitive functions. 
So this kind of imaging of the brain um, has been around for some time now um, and has been used to help distinguish normal people from people with Alzheimer's disease, both in mild as well as more severe stages uh, of illness. Now, uh, here's an interesting study that was published uh, 10 years ago, which was one of the first to illuminate the uh, potential of using this kind of technology to help us identify people at risk before the actual onset of symptoms of dementia. Uh, first, I want you to just look at the left-hand side of this, and you'll see um, two PET images of the brain. One where the person carries the ApoE4 allele, meaning they have um, a risk factor for getting Alzheimer's, and one where there's no risk factor for Alzheimer's. And both of these are normal memory. Both of these patients have normal memory. These scans are done in living people. So both of these patients have normal memory function, but one of these people carries a genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out that the person who carries the genetic risk factor has less glucose being used by their brain cells than the person who doesn't have the risk factor. Okay? So just by having the genetic risk factor, even though you're functioning, functioning normally cognitively, we can already detect changes in how your brain is using glucose. Okay, and then you contrast the pattern of abnormality with the far right, and that's a patient or patients that are actually showing the dementia syndrome, that are showing the symptoms. So what the numbers there mean is an 18% or 12% reduction in glucose metabolism because of the genetic risk factor, and then by the time you show the dementia, you've got a 20 and 22% reduction in glucose utilization. What we also find uh, is that if we continue to scan the same people uh, over time, then people who have the genetic risk factor, even though they don't have dementia, even though they don't have cognitive problems, that over time, the abnormality that's detected at baseline gets worse and worse. Meaning at some point, the person will cross a threshold where the abnormality in glucose utilization is sufficiently bad that the patient now is starting to show clinical signs and symptoms of dementia. These are markers through neuroimaging that with the advancement of technology, these kinds of scans we believe will help us to identify people at risk for getting Alzheimer's disease many years before the onset of symptoms. And then through interventions, we can see whether the glucose metabolism is being stabilized or whether it's actually being improved, okay, in a way that otherwise would be very difficult to do in people who are functioning normally when we give them pen and pencil tasks to do in terms of cognition. Now, here's another kind of brain imaging which has emerged over the last decade, the last 10 years. And in this kind of PET scanning, we're not looking at how much sugar or glucose is being used, utilized by the brain cells. Instead, we are directly imaging in vivo. We are directly imaging within living persons the actual accumulation of some of the abnormal proteins which we believe damage nerve cells and give rise to the clinical syndrome of dementia. So um, if it's not familiar to you, I'll tell you a little bit about this. Uh, one of the important pathological events that we think occurs in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease is the accumulation of a protein called amyloid. And we believe that as this protein starts to accumulate in abnormal amounts, it damages the ability of nerve cells to function properly. And there are a host of hypotheses as to how these, this damage occurs. Some people believe it's largely influenced by inflammatory mechanisms. Um, other people believe it has to do with oxidative cell damage and the, um, the accumulation of uh, damaging free radicals within um, neighboring brain cells. And most people believe it's some combination uh, of the above. What this scan technique does is it actually helps us to identify the accumulation of this abnormal protein amyloid within the living brain. And where you see more red and yellow, you're seeing more accumulation. And so if you compare the left side of the screen with the right, what you'll find is in terms of the color panels, you can see a clear difference between the patient with Alzheimer's disease and the patient who's a control, meaning normal. Um, big difference in terms of how much red and yellow there is, how much amyloid is accumulating. Um, the reason why you see the, uh, the gray, the black and white scans next to them is to demonstrate that through a very typical brain scan, like a CAT scan or MRI, it's a lot harder to tell the difference between somebody with Alzheimer's disease and a control, right? 
But if you look at the color images, the PET scanning images of uh, what's called Pittsburgh Compound B, which binds to amyloid, you can see dramatic differences. And so that's why this technology holds such great promise for us, why it's such an advance uh, from CAT scans or MRI scans, which most of us are more familiar with. Now, it also turns out that uh, many scientists around the world are developing the uh, cardiac, um, the brain equivalent of a cardiac uh, treadmill or a cardiac stress test. And uh, the kind of imaging that we're using for this is called functional MRI. And um, what we literally do is we will put people uh, in a chamber in a functional MRI scanner and we'll give them cognitive tests to do. And we'll take a group of healthy people and we'll divide them into two groups. One group carries a genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. One group doesn't. But they're both healthy. No problems cognitively whatsoever. We put them in the fMRI machine while they're engaged in these challenging cognitive tasks. At the end of the task, both groups get the same number of correct answers. Those with the gene uh, risk factor, those without. However, the pattern of brain activation that we see on the brain scan is quite different in the two groups. The group that carries the genetic risk factor seems to need to recruit more brain areas to help get that same task done than the group that doesn't have the genetic risk factor, meaning they're working harder. They're having to get more brain areas involved to get the task accomplished perhaps because of this genetic risk factor and changes that are already occurring in the brain well before the person's noticing or showing any signs of cognitive problems. It's as if you ask two people to run a mile on a treadmill and they both end up running the mile, but one person, because they carry a genetic risk factor for heart disease, is a lot more pooped okay, and out of breath at the end of that mile on the treadmill than the other but they wouldn't have known it unless they got on the treadmill and we measured how their breathing was. Everybody with me? Okay, in terms of the analogy? Okay, so this is another area where we are challenging people by giving them the equivalent of a cardiac stress test, but this is a brain stress test, and we're looking at differences in terms of functional MRI patterns. So um, how is it uh, that all of this um, presents an opportunity for us? Well. Uh, it is largely related uh, to a concept of reserve. And when I say reserve, what I mean is, even if the forest, even if the forest is going to be thinned out as a result of the normal aging process or a genetic risk factor that we carry for forest fires, meaning trees and branches get damaged, um, we can maybe impact how thick that forest is. We can build reserve. So if something bad starts to happen, we don't notice it as much. If there's a small fire that burns out some trees, but it's a very thick forest from the air, we may not notice the impact very much. But if it's a thin forest to begin with, and we take out some trees from the air, we will notice it. And the same concept applies to our brains. If we can maintain or build a thick connectivity between different brain regions, then that could protect us against some loss of connectivity as we get older, either part of the normal aging process or part of a disease process like Alzheimer's disease, which we know disrupts the thickness of the forest or the connectivity between different neuronal populations. That connectivity is called synaptic density. So let's take a pathogenesis uh, like the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease, where amyloid starts to accumulate, neurochemical depletion starts to occur, brain cells are not functioning effectively, they're not communicating well with one another, and the person thus affected suffers confusion or dementia. Well, clearly the pathogenesis leads to brain changes. Those brain changes have a clinical or cognitive outcome. We call that mild cognitive impairment or dementia when it's severe. But brain reserve has some potential mitigating impact on how much the pathogenesis uh, will affect the brain changes. So how badly the forest fire damages that forest may depend on how many trees there are and how thick they are. And the same thing is true in terms of brain reserve. So we have the opportunity then to build up sufficient brain reserve so that the impact of the pathogenesis on the brain changes is mitigated. The other thing that we can do is by building up brain reserve, we may also be building up cognitive reserve. 
So by building up the strength of our heart muscle, we may be also building up the effectiveness with which our heart pumps blood. By building up the connectedness between neurons, between brain cells, we may also be building up the effectiveness of our cognitive abilities. And so that's called cognitive reserve. So if I've built up a lot of cognitive reserve and I start to have some difficulties cognitively, they may not be as functionally important because I can overcome them. I can compensate for them. I'll give you an example. Well, before I came to Canada and I was practicing in central New Jersey at a medical school there, um, many of the patients referred to me were professors, either from Rutgers University, from Princeton University, and some of the brightest from the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, the place where Einstein was. And um, some of these very, very intellectually gifted people would come to see me because they would notice that their theorems were not quite as sophisticated anymore. It was a bit harder for them to now calculate the size of the universe than it had been <laughs> um, perhaps a few years before, and they wanted to know, you know what was happening to them. Now, of course, with my pencil and paper tasks, I could not, uh, for the life of me, be able to detect that there's a problem. Uh, in somebody who had the uh, cognitive capacity to calculate the size of the universe. Um, these kinds of hyperintelligent people or supernormals have tremendous amount of cognitive reserve. So there has to be a significant enough amount of brain damage before not only are they having difficulty solving theorems, but they're having difficulty remembering where they left their keys. Now, those such people were pro perhaps genetically endowed. Um, with very thick forests. Um, but um, we know now through some of the science that I told you about before that it's never too late for us to build our cognitive reserve. Uh, and the ways we can do that is by building brain reserve as well as by exercising our brains in a sufficient manner to make them more efficient. Uh, and that sort of sets the stage for, I think, the, the promise um, of this field going forward uh, and um, trying to discriminate between hope in this area of brain fitness and the hype, because uh, there's plenty of both uh, to be uh, handed out. So in terms of looking at um, how might we leverage the science that's emerged to guide what we can do about maintaining good brain fitness throughout the lifespan, the brain fitness area um, accomplishes a lot of different things. One area certainly is to look at nutrition and physical exercise. Now we know through a lot of studies done in cardiovascular health that there are good nutritional practices to keep our hearts healthy and there are bad nutritional practices that will damage our hearts. And we know that living an increasingly sedentary lifestyle and not getting off the couch is not good for cardiovascular fitness and we now know that it's not good for brain fitness. Um, we can apply these concepts to brain fitness as a result of studies that have been done largely in rodents. I'm going to share some of these with you. Some studies that are retrospective, that have looked back on how human beings have conducted themselves throughout their adult lives. Um, is it that people who are very physically active and engaged in good nutrition, are they at decreased risk for ultimately of getting Alzheimer's disease? Those kinds of um, prospective or case, retrospective or case control studies have been done. Um, there are also trials now, prospective studies, where we we'll randomize people into two groups. One group just does whatever they want in terms of their lifestyle, their exercise, their nutrition. Other group is in a controlled experiment where um, we control how much exercise the person gets, what their nutrition is, etc. And then we see after a long time who's better off as a result. Is there any different? Um, so there are a variety of different ways in which the science here has, has come together. Um, if you were to look in the literature that's emerged about brain fitness and nutrition, what you're going to find is a couple of themes continue to emerge. There's some debate in our field as to whether these studies are rigorous enough, but largely the evidence that's accumulating has been telling us is that um, we want to try to maximize the intake of those things which protect brain cells and minimize the intake of those things that damage brain cells. Um, one of the areas that I think has gained a lot of currency is in the area of reducing uh, certain kinds of fats. So reducing omega-6 fats in preference of omega-3 fatty acids or fats. Uh, and we're already seeing the commercial application of this where our margarines, our eggs, and other foods are now being supplemented uh, with omega-3. Um, and so this is an area of nutrition and brain health that you're going to continue to hear quite a lot about, uh, I think, over the next uh, few years. 
Uh, another area is to increase the intake of foods with very high antioxidant potential. Uh, there's a lot being written about now in terms of green leafy vegetables. So substances like broccoli and spinach and kale, uh, because they're high in antioxidant properties. Uh, tomatoes, which contain high amounts of lycopene, which is also believed to be neuroprotective. Uh, some, pe some people believe certain spices, uh, like a curcumin, um, that this, uh, which is found in a lot of Indian foods, may also be um, helpful. Uh, and of course, uh, many of you are hearing about all kinds of other things that uh, putatively are good for, for overall nutrition. Um, I think another area, and we've done some research in this at Baycrest, uh, is in the area of glycemic control. Uh, and there's some evidence to suggest that uh, we really should avoid foods um, that are called um, um, high glycemic index foods, where we get sudden spar uh, very big spikes in blood glucose. So uh, we want to avoid those sudden blood glucose spikes. Um, very, very strong correlation now emerging between uh, regulation of cerebral or brain glucose control and the cognitive impairment. So watch out for, for more uh, in this area. Um, so these are the kinds of healthy brain diets that people are writing a lot about um, that I just alluded to, the antioxidant foods, the green leafy vegetables, the berries, blueberries in particular, um, and Mediterranean diets uh, and the like things that are high in omega-3 fatty acids. Um, I don't have it on this slide, but um, many people, I'm certainly among them, um, are big believers in the antioxidant potential of red wine. Um, I personally didn't require rigorous scientific studies uh, to be conducted to convince me of that. Um, I know that red wine's good for me, uh, whether it's protecting my brain cells or not. Uh, so I'm a believer in that. Uh, and red wine uh, does have uh, high concentrations of flavonoids, and, and we do believe that they have a strong antioxidant potential. Um, certainly a lot's been written in recent years about lifestyle choices and how that might impact good, good brain fitness as uh, we age. Um, the link between physical exercise and strong cognitive performance is just getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, and I'm going to talk about it in more depth in just a minute. What's also becoming clear to us, though, is that um, we are social animals. And as we get older, through some of the losses that we may accumulate, like our children move away, our grandchildren are living apart from us, perhaps our spouses have died, some of our friends have died, that social isolation is not good for our brains, that we are social creatures, we are by our nature affiliative and like to be in groups, and that probably was programmed into our DNA uh, to help us survive, to hunt together, to gather together, to uh, support each other. Uh, and that uh, innate need of human beings doesn't disappear because of social factors. And so it's very important that we continue to nourish ourselves in terms of social engagement. Um, it's also important um, in a related fashion uh, to keep our brains stimulated um, by activities that are novel and are challenging. Uh, so when people ask me, as they often do, should I do crossword puzzles or Sudoku or other things like that, all I can respond to right now is we don't really know. Um, the evidence is not very strong for crossword puzzles. It's debatable. But what we do know is that if you engage in activities that are both challenging, that force you to problem solve in a way you haven't before, uh, and that are stimulating and engaging, then those kinds of activities will exercise your brain. And this is a great challenge for us um, in developing techniques for people to use that are not only fun, but actually are strengthening their brain performance. And I'm going to get to this in just a few minutes, because most of the people listening to this talk today already know that getting on a treadmill several times a day, for perhaps several times a week, for perhaps uh, half an hour says a good thing. Right? Several times a day would be a nightmare. But several times a week <laughs> is likely a good thing. But why don't more of us do it? Because it's not so fun for many of us. It's boring. Not all of us get that endorphin rush that keeps us going when we physically exercise. And if it's boring, if it's not stimulating, if it doesn't engage us, we don't want to do it. And then we don't do it, and it's not as effective in getting us into good uh, cardiopulmonary shape. So the same is going to be true here in the brain fitness field. We've got to find ways, and we're starting to, to exercise these brain cells in a way that's entertaining, engaging, and most importantly, effective. Um, also important is that uh, we know 
that one of the worst things for healthy brain performance is too much stress. Too much stress leads to high levels of brain cortisol, and brain cortisol, a stress hormone, is not good for neural integrity uh, and the efficiency with which neurons communicate with one another. So it's incumbent upon us as we get older to find ways, if we haven't already, to mitigate this stress response in terms of affecting our brains. So it's really important us, for us to find activities, to find things that we enjoy that lower our overall stress threshold, but that, that raise our stress threshold, that make our stress levels lower. Um, and those can be uh, formal things like yoga or meditation, and it could also involve avoiding things that we know stress us out. Um, but the connection between stress and brain uh, performance is getting very, very tight. So this is another very interesting area of science. All right, the physical exercise story, as I said before, is just building dramatically. And I'm going to give you a reference uh, at the end of the talk if you're particularly interested in this, in this aspect of the topic. But uh, we know that um, aerobic exercise, where you get the heart pumping, leads the, to the production of factors within brains, both in rodents as well as we believe human beings, that help to grow more branches and leaves on our trees, on our brain cells. Um, I'll give you an example of a study that demonstrated this in a, in a pretty compelling way. So you take two groups of mice. One group of, one group of mice is going to be exercised. The other group of mice is not going to be exercised. They're going to be couch potato mice. Okay? Now, uh, when we take these mice, we genetically program their brains so that all the mice, whether they're going to be exercised or not, all the mice are going to be genetically programmed to develop the mouse version of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. Now, we can do that now. That's called the transgenic mouse model. We literally take human gene mutations and we insert them into the DNA of mice. We've been able to do this for many years. And then we can induce the accumulation of amyloid, that abnormal protein, within the mouse brains. Okay, so we take these unfortunate mice, we program their brains genetically to start to form amyloid, uh, damaging their brains to cause the mouse version of Alzheimer's. And now we divide these mice into two groups. One group we're going to give a treadmill to, we're going to give them their wheel, and we're going to encourage them to exercise. And the other group of mice are just going to be lying there. They're not going to exercise. Well, after a period of comparing the exercised mice versus the non-exercised mice, remember, both of them have been programmed to develop the mouse version of Alzheimer's, those that exercise have less amyloid forming in their brain. Okay? So that was a compelling uh, study. The other thing we know is that um, the more we exercise normal mice, the stronger the ability is for us to teach them new things. So then, when we sacrifice these mice and we look at the parts of the brain in the mouse that's responsible for new learning, specifically what are called the hippocampi, mesial portion of their temporal lobes, what we find is that we're increasing the amount of active stem cells okay, that are growing new nerve cells within those critical brain regions for learning new things. So another study that was done, I thought that was important to bring to your attention, is that if you take a group of, um, of young mice and you damage their brains by irradiating their brains, exposing them to radiation which damages their brains, and then you separate them into two groups, those that you exercise, those that you don't allow to exercise, you can see that you're able to protect more of the brain cells within the critical areas necessary for learning, again specifically in the hippocampal regions. So there's something about exercise which we think largely has to do with inducing a neurotrophic and other factors that protects our brain cells and helps them to thrive. In humans, there are studies that have been published that demonstrate that physical exercise seems to be correlated with stronger cognitive performance. And I'm going to tell you about two groups of people where this has been demonstrated. For one, there have been studies done in the Midwest of the United States where you take a middle school and high school students and you randomize them into two groups. One group gets conventional gym, which means a lot of standing around and socializing. <laughs> and the other group is real gym, meaning physical exercise to get everybody into shape. You now follow these kids over several years and you measure their educational attainment in school. 
And guess who does better? The students who are more rigorously exercised, that are kept in better shape. This is a great opportunity for us, for our children. What we wonder, though, and what concerns us is what's the impact of the internet revolution, of handheld devices, of our kids being able to stay socially engaged without having to actually get up from a chair or a couch? And what's the impact going to be, particularly with what we're seeing in terms of childhood obesity, knowing that obesity is a risk factor for dementia as well? And what's going to be the impact on our children? So while it's nice to say that we baby boomers need to take advantage of all of this, um, what we need to do is focus on our children. Uh, and ensure that they engage in the kinds of healthy lifestyle habits, kinds of nutritional practices, physical exercise and social engagement, meaning being with people that we know is good for our brains. Another study I thought you might find interesting is that if you take uh, women that carry the APOE4 genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and these are seniors, these are healthy older women, like this very attractive woman on this slide, and we divide them into two groups, those women who participate in a very active aerobic fitness program and those who don't, these are all healthy people, those that engage in the aerobic fitness program perform at a higher cognitive level. All of these women have that gene risk factor for Alzheimer's, but those that are physically exercised are performing at a higher cognitive level. None of them have dementia, but they can improve their cognitive performance by getting involved in a strong aerobic fitness program. Six months of moderate levels of aerobic exercise produce significant improvements in, in cognition. The greatest impact is on that area of cognition which is most vulnerable to the normal aging process, and that's executive functioning. Uh, being able to multitask, problem solve quickly, uh, uh, discriminate important stimuli from distractions that are not important. And in these studies, we can also see enhanced performance on brain imaging in terms of brain activity measures. In some brain scans, we can actually see volume changes where parts of the brain seem to be growing and thriving, building more trees, more connections between those trees. Um, a large review was done of this uh, in the Cochrane um, uh, database. Uh, I would imagine this, the Cochrane methodology is familiar to many of you. This was published uh, a little less than two years ago. There is evidence that aerobic physical activities which improve cardiorespiratory fitness are beneficial for cognitive function in healthy older adults with effects observed for motor function, cognitive speed, delayed memory, and auditory and visual attention. So um, this science that's emerged now over several years is promising a lot. Uh, it's promising the, us that we should be able to develop techniques to better assess and monitor cognitive performance over time using imaging and other biomarkers, that there are exercises we should be able to develop to take advantage of the capacity to grow new brain cells to build the thickness of the connectedness between these brain cells, that nutrition is going to be an important element as our lifestyle decisions and physical exercise. And of course, there's great opportunity and tremendous amount of research going on globally around developing both neuroprotective agents, agents we can take, drugs that protect our brain cells um, when they're under the stress of normal aging as well as disease, and perhaps even neuromaintaining and neuroenhancing drugs. Now, this latter category of neuroenhancing drugs, particularly for use in healthy people, um, is quite controversial, and it's led to a field that's pejoratively called cosmetic neurology. <laughs> so we have accepted as a society that if we wish to look better, look younger as we get older, it's okay to go to a plastic surgeon and get a facelift or a tummy tuck to restore us to a youthful appearance. Now, what if it turned out that a drug could be developed that was proven to be safe, about as safe as plastic surgery is, and there are risks, no doubt, but it's also safe for many people. And there was a drug that we could take, let's say in middle age, me as an executive running a hospital, and it would be proven to help me stay on my game. It would help me to be a very effective hospital CEO, so I don't have to worry about my younger CFO, who reports to me, taking my job <laughs> All right, And just imagine this opportunity in companies, corporations, and schools, as the professor's getting older, worried about being pushed out, right, retire. Imagine if there was a drug that helped us stay on our game. Imagine better yet, as troublesome as that might be, perhaps, that there was a drug that if we gave it to our kids, 
this drug would improve their SAT scores by 30 <laughs> points, and it would give them a better shot at getting into the University of Toronto or McGill or you know some great school. Would we as parents want to give our kids that edge if we were convinced that the drug was reasonably safe? Um, these may sound like um, hypothetical situations that we're not going to have to confront, but the revolutionary changes that are occurring right now in brain science, where we're better understanding what it is that makes us smart and what it is that happens to us as we get old that slows down our cognitive function. These advances are occurring at such a rapid rate that there's going to be a whole new world out there of how we think about all of this. And you don't need to take my word for it. Um, a whole industry now is evolving to take advantage of these preclinical diagnostics and techniques to maximize our cognitive performance. In terms of cognitive exercise and rehabilitating the damaged brain, what we're trying to do is to take advantage of scientific advances in research and go from pencil and paper, puzzles, games, and brain teasers, which we just generically think might be good for us, to much more sophisticated technology-based ways to exercise our brains. And these, com these include web-based applications that you can actually uh, engage in right now for a fee, uh, computer games that you can purchase, memory training programs that you can participate in. We offer some of these at, the Bay at Baycrest, informed by science that's done at the Rotman Research Institute and software applications that are being developed that will fit on your Blackberry, <laughs> on your cell phone. Um, this device that you see here, this Trio, is a device that's carrying a software application that was developed at Baycrest uh, in partnership with Palm, where people who are horribly brain damaged and have terrible memory problems are using the Palm Pilot to completely organize their lives. And when they pull out in a restaurant so they don't forget what to do when the waiter comes up to the table, the software has been developed to take advantage of those cognitive abilities that are still intact that can compensate for the cognitive abilities that are horribly damaged. And when this person pulls out the device, nobody notices that they're pulling out an assistive device because everybody pulls out their Blackberry or their cell phone. Uh, so you can't tell whether the person is using this as a rehab strategy or whether they're using it to check on their next appointment when they're done with lunch. Uh, and this is an area of active research at Baycrest, and you're going to hear more about this, I, I think, uh, in coming years from others uh, as well. Now, right now, um, a huge commercial enterprise has been launched to take advantage of our needs to keep our brains fit and healthy for as long as possible. This is the Nintendo product, Brain Age, based on some neuroscience done in Japan. Um, I think many of us in the field believe that while Brain Age may be fun to play, um, we're waiting to see more scientific validation that it actually strengthens cognitive ability. Um, but for now, it's fun. Um, but we believe that what we put out there to the public as a field has to be more than fun. We've got to be very clear as to what's fun to do because it's fun to do and what is fun and also having a measurable impact on improving or maintaining cognitive ability. Um, we've got to be very careful in our field not to go the path of nutraceuticals where because the industry has been largely unregulated, people can make claims for all kinds of nutritional supplements that tell you that your body's being strengthened, your brain's being strengthened, without there being rigorous scientific validation. We are not going to allow that to happen, at least as far as most of us who are leading this field can do, in the brain fitness field in terms of exercising the brain. Um, we will only put a product out there, at least at Baycrest, uh, if it's scientifically validated. Here's another one now. You can go onto the internet and you can sign up for CogniFit. And I'm going to just read some of the claims that are on this website. Scientific research shows that brain exercises help slow down the natural decline of cognitive abilities that comes with aging. After just three training cycles, 91% of CogniFit Brain Fitness Program users improve their overall cognitive vitality. Okay, what that doesn't tell us is, number one, what is cognitive vitality? What does that mean? And number two is, uh, what percentage of the controls that were given a placebo condition um, also improve their overall cognitive vitality? Okay, so that's what we would expect to see in scientific validation, not just a commercial uh, uh, claim. Um, personalized brain training programs are proven to be more efficient than brain games. 
Uh, and I think that that's a potentially a spurious claim until more data have emerged. But Cognifit, um, I think, I don't mean to disparage their company. I just mean to say that we're all going to be overwhelmed by many of these kinds of claims, and it's going to be important for us to be able to discriminate what's been validated and what uh, has not. Posit Science, uh, to their credit, and I, I believe I have a slide on their, on their uh, scientific validation in a moment, to their credit, um, I think they've worked harder to demonstrate that there is scientific validation in peer-reviewed journals uh, for some of the techniques that they've now built into their memory and uh, cognitive training programs. But uh, if this is of interest to you, I would urge you to go to their website uh, and take a look at their product. Uh, they're a market leader right now. Lumosity um, is another a company that's establishing market share. Um, this claim is brain training scientifically designed, shown to improve memory and attention, fun and easy, full workout in less than 10 minutes a day. Boy, that sounds pretty good. Full workout in less than 10 minutes a day. Start your training today. Well, sign me up. If I could touch the slide that's up there right now, I'd hit that green star training button. Okay, so um, I think that, um, again, we're going to see a lot of this uh, starting to emerge. Um, there's a huge commercial opportunity here. That's why we're seeing this with the baby boomers. Um, this market in U.S. dollars uh, was about $100 million, $100 million and somewhat less than five years ago. Uh, it went up uh, to $225 million in two years. Uh, in 2008, this market was at $265 million, and it's now projected that this market could grow up to $4 billion by 2015. So there's a huge amount of commercial investment right now in this whole brain fitness marketplace. Um, and it's largely being driven uh, by the consumer um, and healthcare segments. That's largely where it's being uh, driven, as you can see on this uh, slide. Okay, so we've known for some time that, um, that people like to engage in leisure activities that stimulate their brains. We all know this. Um, but what we're really trying to work on right now is to develop the techniques that improve and sustain cognitive performance. There are data out there now that demonstrate that the rigorous exercising of our brains, we can improve cognitive performance, we can sustain this cognitive performance for years. But not all of this exercise are games, and not all of it's fun, and some of it is very demanding. It requires a lot of time and attention on our parts. Um, these are studies uh, that were published in JAMA, um, in the last couple of years, long-term effects of cognitive training and functional outcomes in older adults, five-year follow-up of randomized, a uh, lot of, lot of single-blind trial with one control, three treatment groups, large numbers of people, almost 3,000 people participating in this study, mean age of about 74, and they received reasoning, memory, visual attention, speed training. Improvement was noted on cognitive tests lasting up to five years. Importantly, though, while these kinds of training exercises can demonstrate improved cognition, what's not so clear is whether people notice any change in their everyday life. So we can test them, and we can see that they're functioning at a higher level, but are they noticing it in day-to-day -day life? Meaning, if you exercise somebody, and you can improve their cardiac output, the efficiency of their heart pounding, by 10, Okay, from a cardiac output of 50 to 60, that's all well and good. But if they're not noticing that they're huffing and puffing less when they climb stairs, who cares? And that's one of the challenges for our brain field right now. Uh, we've got to get to the so what question. And there are other studies as well. This is a study that was recently published in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, and it was using the techniques that have been developed in posit science. So Posit Science is a commercial uh, program. You can purchase it now to exercise your brain. And this is a scientific validation of the technique that was published in a major peer-reviewed journal. Here it's about 500 people participating, all cognitively normal, uh, randomized to either the Posit Science memory and other cognitive training program or general control a condition. But it's a lot of brain exercising. It's an hour a day, five days a week for two months. That's a lot. And the result was the experimental program, the positive science program, improved generalized measures of memory and attention more than the control program. All right, uh, here's a review that was published very recently um, of the cognitive interventions in healthy older people. The existing literature is limited by a lack of consensus on what constitutes the most effective type of cognitive training. 
insufficient follow-up times, a lack of matched active controls, and few outcome measures showing changes in daily functioning, global cognitive skills, or progression to early Alzheimer's. So there's a lot of work yet to be done here. Um, there have been studies um, trying to demonstrate whether cognitive training delays the onset of dementia. And for now, um, in this meta-analysis, cognitive exercise has not been shown to prevent incident dementia. So while it might strengthen our cognitive abilities, um, it doesn't necessarily prevent us from then getting dementia. And I think that this is a very important area of research that we need to continue to pour much more effort into it, because very little research has actually been done in this area. Well, we saw sufficient opportunity here in Ontario um, to pursue science that could lead to some tangible solutions that would benefit us in terms of maintaining brain health. But this government, uh, a little over a year ago, decided to invest in Canada's first academically-based center for brain fitness, taking the science uh, from the laboratory to the proverbial bedside. And so uh, we were very lucky at Baycrest is where the center was created, built on the neuroscience we have there. And so we create a center for brain fitness. And what's happening is that these centers are now popping up in major research institutions around the world. So many of the research institutions, like the Rotman here at Baycrest in Toronto, that have been focusing on brain and cognition, now are forming centers especially dedicated to taking the intellectual property from the research uh, bench and turning it into techniques, products, applications that will benefit people as they age to keep their brains healthy and strong. The Center for Brain Fitness is working on a whole variety of different products right now. Um, there's clinical assessment software to help healthcare providers keep better track of the cognitive state of their patients. Brain fitness products for healthy aging adults like uh, most of us boomers. Uh, fitness products for seniors residing within residential care settings executive training programs for the workplace to help executives in the workplace keep their cognitive skills sharp and to strengthen them, as well as a variety of other products in development. Um, we recently announced the launch of a new for-profit company. This is a collaboration between uh, the Ontario government that gave us the, the funding to start the Center for Brain Fitness, MARS, which is an incubator here for intellectual property and commercialization, and Baycrest. And so Baycrest has an 80% equity position in Cognicity. Mars has a 20% uh, position. And we are going to take our science and we're going to turn it into scientifically validated products that will help us all to uh, maintain brain fitness. Um, uh, if you're interested in doing more reading about this topic, there are a couple of books um, that I think are quite responsible in terms of their review of the present state of the field. Um, and they're written, uh, I think, in a language that would have a wide appeal. Perhaps you've heard of some of these books. Um, a great book that just came out recently is uh, from an organization called Sharp Brains. Um, I'd encourage you to take a look at their website. Um, they are the industry leading analytical uh, firm. Um, they really are on top of where this whole field is headed, and they give us this information in a very responsible way. So you can go to their website, which I believe is just sharpbrains.com. Uh, uh, they also have this book, which is just a great review uh, of where the field is and where it's headed. Um, very nice book written by um, our own in Toronto, Norman Doidge. Um, uh, talks about sort of the promise of advances in neuroscience and helping us to keep our brains healthy and to restore function in damaged brains. Another book that I'd recommend to you is written by John Rady, uh, and it talks about how strong the link is between physical fitness, physical exercise, and maintaining good brain uh, health. And that's not only for adults, but for children uh, as well. Uh, John uh, made his mark and being one of the world's leading experts in attention deficit uh, disorder. Um, two books for the scientific community that, uh, that I would highly recommend. One book recently edited by a good friend of mine and colleague at the University of California in San Diego, um, Jill Jesty, is called Successful Cognitive and Emotional Aging. This book just came out. It's multi-authored by the leading thinkers in the world. Uh, strongly recommended for those of you who are interested in uh, the basic neuroscience and the bridge to clinical application. And then finally, again, uh, probably um, the most sophisticated treatment um, really for people with a background in neuroscience and uh, neurorehabilitation is a book assembled by our own Rotman scientists uh, here in Toronto uh, called Cognitive Neurorehabilitation, Evidence and Application, and also uh, a very good book. So with that, I'd like to thank you uh, all, wherever you may be, uh, for your attention. And uh, I'm happy to take some questions for, for a couple of minutes here. Thank you all. Yes, thank you. A question about the availability uh, and access for PET scans, brain scans. 
Okay, so um, right here in Canada now, uh, PET scanning for brain um, is uh, largely unavailable. Uh, so um, we don't have it. In the United States, uh, PET scanning is available for clinical purposes, um, but only to address a very specific question that a clinician might have. Um, and that question is, is the patient suffering from Alzheimer's disease or from another form of dementia called frontotemporal dementia? There are rare circumstances where the clinical presentation is so sufficiently perplexing that the PET scan might be the best way to distinguish the diagnosis. And it's important to distinguish because it has implications for treatment. But that's in a small number of patients that present to a memory clinic like in the one where I see patients. Uh, here in Canada, PET scanning is available as it is around the world for research purposes. Uh, much of the science that's being done at the University of Toronto, CAMH, Baycrest, Sunnybrook, other places here in Toronto um, is using PET scan uh, as a method, both using uh, glucose uh, metabolism, as I discussed before, uh, as well as amyloid imaging. All right, so it's widely available for search purposes, but not for clinical application. Other questions? Yes? What is the value to the patient of being identified as having some cognitive deficits. Okay, so the question is, you know, what is the value to a patient, uh, to an individual, of having cognitive deficits? So um, it depends really on, I think, the severity of the cognitive deficits and what the cause is. So if somebody has cognitive deficits and meets the criteria for dementia and the cause is Alzheimer's disease, then it's very important. Know that, right? Uh, it's important to know uh, what treatment's available, but importantly, how to ensure that that patient is safe uh, and um, is well cared for and can live the happiest possible life despite the dementia syndrome. Uh, so, I think for somebody with dementia, it's very important. Now, what we're finding increasingly, though, is that there are patients coming to memory clinics that are suffering not from dementia per se but significant enough memory problems that they meet criteria for what's called mild cognitive. And um, I think there's two important consequences of being able to make that diagnosis for, for a patient. The first is people that meet criteria for mild cognitive impairment, uh, specifically the most common cause uh, of mild cognitive impairment, the most common variety called amnestic uh, mild cognitive impairment, where the deficit is almost essentially in memory function, is that those patients are at much higher risk than the general population for going on to develop Alzheimer's disease. So 15% or more of those patients per year will convert to Alzheimer's disease. After five years, 60 or 70% of them will meet the diagnosis. So many of us believe that mild cognitive impairment is what's called a prodromal uh, condition to the eventual development of Alzheimer's. So those are patients we want to keep very close eye on uh, and make sure that uh, they don't prematurely get into car accidents, make poor financial decisions, forget to take their medications that they need, et cetera. Um, the second reason why it's important, I think, to know when someone has mild cognitive impairment is that there's a whole body of science emerging that's helping us to try to exercise those brains. Uh, so, for example, at uh, Baycrest, um, the uh, cognitive neuroscience that we've been engaged in for 20 years at the Rotman has led to techniques where we actually exercise people's brains that have mild cognitive impairment to see whether we can improve their function. Uh, and uh, we have a whole mild cognitive impairment or MCI program where people come in and they participate in our research, but they also participate in a clinical program where we help them understand what mild cognitive impairment is, what they can do to try to maintain good brain health uh, despite their memory problem based on the best available scientific evidence, and we then expose them to techniques to try to strengthen their brain function and to compensate for it. Uh, so I'd say those are the, the main reasons. Lastly, um, there's a very large group of people who are middle-aged, like me, and they are starting to notice that just like the backs ache in the morning when they get out of bed for no good reason, they are also finding that they're relying more on that Blackberry, more on that calendar to keep track of what's going on. And uh, they want to know, what does this mean? Uh, should I be worried? Is this going to turn into something more serious? And is there something I can do about this? And that's another robust area of science, as we talked about. You know, are there techniques to exercise that healthy brain? Uh, and so we help people to understand what's normal, what's not normal, how to best compensate, what does the available science tell us. Okay. Yes? So I, I was kind of noticing with the, the brain health aspect is the emphasis seems to be on pushing a little bit more training and mm -hmm. do some tests, pushing yourself and exercising those neurons. This, the, the other side of the equation, of course, which I, I'm surprised you didn't mention on your lifestyle, was sleep health. 
sleep is very good for restorative function. It's, there's an argument that society are sleeping way less than the brain needs to function mm -hmm. properly. There's quite good literature that was well, very good literature that Alzheimer's patients sleep poorly. These, these changes that go yes. on with time go yes, on together. Absolutely. The details of the pe recent paper in Science I don't mm -hmm. uh, remember exactly, but there's, there's more than just an association. There's, there's some very strong linkages between the two. So I wonder where you would put the, 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 the emphasis on also maintaining adequate sleep health that would go along with supporting brain health. Yes, yeah, so, well, okay, I'm glad you mentioned that. So uh, for any of you who couldn't quite hear the question, I want to, well, what's the role for ensuring that uh, maximizing the regularity of your circadian rhythm and getting adequate rest at night and getting the right kind of sleep, um, to what extent might that be very health, uh, important in maintaining good brain health? And I think your question also gave us the answer. Mm -hmm. There's an emerging body of science suggesting that sleep deprivation also significantly affects cognitive performance. Uh, and I can tell you that um, we've known this for quite some time, and it led to um, something that uh, I think is very important as a physician, and that's a restriction on young physician and resident and intern work hours. Uh, there's no doubt that, um, that um, the ability uh, to make sound decisions, uh, to be able to be attentive to patients' needs, uh, that this is compromised when you are sleep deprived, and it jeopardizes people. Um, and uh, there's a reason why there are restrictions on, um, on uh, how many hours a pilot can fly an airplane before uh, at least attempting to get a good night's sleep. So we've known for quite some time that without adequate sleep, there's going to be deterioration in your cognitive performance. Um, to what extent in Alzheimer's disease, a disruption of circadian rhythm actually contributes to the cognitive impairment or this is sort of an epiphenomenon, and patients that have cognitive impairment due to you know, damage to certain neural systems also have uh, sleep problems because of damage to allied or other uh, neural systems, I think is still sort of an open question. But I think it's a very important uh, point that you're raising, particularly because um, uh, many patients with Alzheimer's disease uh, do not get adequate sleep. Uh, that's one of the fundamental disruptions uh, that's caused by their dementia. And uh, we also believe that, um, that many of these patients, and if you've lived with this in your own families, you know, experience a phenomenon that's been um, sort of generically referred to as sundowning, um, where the patients do seem to get more restless, uh, perhaps be more resistive uh, to efforts to assist them uh, towards the late afternoon, early evening hours. And there does seem to be a relationship between the integrity of their sleep when it's measured uh, uh, through very careful sleep monitoring and the severity of these kinds of um, of late afternoon, early uh, evening behavioral disturbances. So I think the question was very well placed. Okay, any other questions? Yes. How, how do you make, the, or maybe let me rephrase it, early onset Alzheimer's, where somebody has clearly developed it at a very young age, 50s, early yes. 40s, is that a doubling of the genes, the inheritance that has brought it? All right. Because it is so different. Yes, yes. So um, there's essentially been four confirmed genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. The first, and the one that I talk the most about, the ApoE4 allele, is what's called a susceptibility factor, meaning if you inherit the ApoE4 allele, you're not automatically going to get Alzheimer's disease, but your risk is increased. But you're not automatically going to get it. Okay, That's called a susceptibility. The other three genetic risk factors, though, are causal, meaning if you inherit them, you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. And those three genetic risk factors, we believe, are very important in uh, causing early onset familial Alzheimer's disease. So there are three of them. And early onset Alzheimer's disease is a very rare condition. It accounts for some people believe less than 3% of all cases of Alzheimer's. Other people believe less than 1%. But it's of that ilk. It's a very small percentage of all cases of Alzheimer's disease. About 50% of people that show the early onset of Alzheimer's disease in their 50s, in their 40s, in their 30s have a strong family history. And if they are genetically tested, they will be shown to have one of these three genetic mutations. The most common is called the pre one mutation. It's found on chromosome 14. But uh, the first thing we do is when somebody in their 40s or 50s uh, shows signs of Alzheimer's disease, um, we get a fa good family history. 
And um, if there's people all over the family that have been getting it at a young age, then the likelihood is this family is carrying one of these uh, gene mutations that's causal. Uh, and it's inherited in what's called an autosomal dominant fashion. Uh, so if your parent had this early onset familial Alzheimer's disease, you have a 50% chance uh, yourself of getting it when you get into uh, early middle age. It's sort of like Huntington's disease in terms of how it's in inherited. But then there are a group of people that get Alzheimer's at a young age and they don't have those three gene mutations from familial early onset. And they may not have quite as compelling a family history. Some of those patients did inherit an ApoE4 allele from both parents, unfortunately. They have what's called the homozygous condition. And so it's moved the age of onset up for them, okay, uh, into their 50s or so. Um, but that does not account for the majority of such patients. There are still many genetic risk factors that we haven't been able to identify yet. Yes? In terms of uh, some of the other dementias, uh, um, through my mother having moderate to later vascular dementia and then I'm familiar with people who have the body, yes. how much are there genetic factors or is it much more the environmental and like, lifestyle and biological factors? vascular dimensions, which I, as I understand is more high blood pressure, cholesterol, um, bi biological. Yeah, so for now, so I think for now, all I can say to you is that the same kind of genetic risk factors that may run in families that give rise to vulnerability to cardiovascular or cerebrovascular disease, you know, would be the same risk factors for vascular dementia, all right? So uh, we haven't been able yet uh, to definitively identify risk factors for vascular dementia that are disconnected from risk factors for cardiovascular or cerebrovascular disease. So I think you're right, you know, uh, vulnerability to having high lipids, uh, vulnerability to diabetes, uh, vulnerability to atherosclerosis and heart disease, vulnerability to obesity, um, all of these kinds of risk factors seem to be risk factors for uh, vascular dementia as well. But you're not finding specific Well, no, I wouldn't say that. So in frontotemporal dementia, for example, um, which most people think of as Pick's disease, um, there is a gene mutation that has been identified for frontotemporal dementia with Parkinsonism specifically. About 50% of cases of frontotemporal dementia have a strong family history and appear to be inherited in autosomal dominant fashion. But um, with the exception of the frontotemporal dementia or FTD with Parkinsonism, um, we're still in the hunt for some of those other genetic risk factors. And for other causes, certainly like Parkinson's disease, there are genetic factors. And uh, for Huntington's disease, you know, definitely. Uh, as well as rarer disease like Wilson's disease, et cetera, that can cause dementia. All right, I think I'll take one more question, then we're going to have to wrap up. Yes? Uh, I, I noticed that the, the stress is on uh, aerobic exercises. What about, what benefits are for yoga and uh, tai chi and other gentle exercises? Yeah, so this, this is a good question. So yeah, the, um, so physical exercise uh, is good for managing stress, at least for many people. Um, but um, finding ways to relax and mitigate stress, whatever they may be, if it lowers brain cortisol levels, is probably good. So um, irrespective of good brain health, I think we've already identified uh, many things to help lower our stress levels aside from taking things like alcohol or red wine. Um, so um, whatever works for you is worth pursuing, whether it's active physical exercise, uh, and you know when your stress level's been reduced and when it hasn't. You, when, you know when you're, you're on edge and when you're not. Whether it's Tai Chi for some people, for others, like my wife, it's yoga, she loves it. Um, for others, it's actually doing things like uh, exercising like progressive muscle relaxation or uh, deep breathing exercises to relax, or uh, self-hypnosis or guided imagery. So um, uh, whatever fits you best, um, I'd recommend you try. But build into your lifestyle some stress reduction techniques or efforts <coughs> that you can identify specifically you've made part of your lifestyle, okay? Make sure you can clearly identify what those things are. Because if you can't, the likelihood it is you haven't identified them. Okay, so that would be my advice. Uh, along with good nutrition, physical exercise, we keep this brain stimulated with novel and interesting things. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.